Difter. My name is Sean Esther Powell and I am a museum worker and amateur folklorist from Mid Cornwall. Now I am here to talk to you today about Cornish folklore and in particular Cornish piskies. Now you may have heard of pixies or piskies before. They are definitely something that likely would have come up in pop culture that you consume. So whether that is the band Pixies, one of my favourites, I have to admit, or whether it's a pixie haircut, or if you've ever watched or read Harry Potter, which I'm sure many of you will have done, the Cornish Pixies and that, it's Piskies. But what you might not have known is that there are lots of different kinds of Cornish Pixie. Pisky. So Cornwall is a land that has a lot of diverse landscapes. We have fields and moors, we have woodland, we have coast and in all of these different landscapes there exists a version of the Cornish Pisky. Now I'm going to attempt in about 20 minutes to sum up some of the different types of Cornish Piskies and their attributes to you. So you've probably heard of the most common one, the standard Cornish Pisky who likes to sit on little toadstools like this. Um, in lots of different types of folklore these Piskies are found on the moors or in kind of natural enchanted areas like woodland and still even today when I go for a walk in the woods I get a feeling of ooh I could I can I can believe that there could be something here. Now these Piskies are usually depicted as being very small and you can see them on charm bracelets sitting on a toadstool like this. But in a lot of the written literary evidence, or I say evidence, along the, um, the literary folk tales that have been collected by people, these piskies are in fact usually described as being about three foot tall and in ragged clothing. Now, a word that I'm probably going to use quite a lot in this 20 minute segment is the word capricious. Piskies are capricious, so they are capable of doing quite nasty things. There's stories of changeling children where uh, a human child is stolen away by the fair folk and swapped with one of their own. And, but there are also stories of Piskies helping in the house or helping on the farm. Um, but if they do this, if they help you on your land, you should never give them a gift of new clothing because if you do, they'll bugger off and disappear. <laughs> you give them a new coat or a new jacket, they're usually covered in rags. They'll be like, thank you ever so much, bye bye. <laughs> and then you will never see them again. So um, depends if you're feeling very charitable or if you desperately need help on your farm. So that is the kind of common Pisky, the one that dances in meadows and dances on the moors and can lead you astray, steal your children or help you out or, as I said, sometimes lead you astray. Now, that is a term called pisky led. To be pisky led is usually to be completely lost on the moors or somewhere similar like that. And I can give you some survival tips on how you can, in fact, avoid being pisky led. You can either turn your clothing inside out. For some reason, unbeknownst to me, I have still never figured out why they don't like this, but for some reason, piskies really, really hate it when you turn your clothes inside out. It might just be that they look at you and think, oh my God, that person is too mad, too bonkers, even for me to bother with. I'm just gonna leave them well alone. Um, but another survival tip I've got for you is to carry a bit of salt in your pocket. Because like fairies and iron, apparently piskies do not like salt. So that is your common Cornish pisky. That's the most popular of the piskies and the most well known. So what of the other different types of Cornish pisky? Um, you might have heard of knockers. So those are my personal favourite pisky. 
knockers much like the Welsh cobbler eye and I'm in fact recording this on St David's Day <laughs> ready for St Piram's Day uh, and I am a Cornish and Welsh woman but I'm not the only thing that binds Cornwall and Wales together um, there are very similar stories concerning the Cornish knocker and the Welsh cobbler eye now these are mine piskies these are small spirits or you know sometimes described as spirits sometimes described as earthy creatures but they are small in size and they usually dress up in miniature mining garb and they carry with them a small lantern and a small pickaxe as well now the knockers they as well as the cobbler eye in Wales and possibly the kobold in German folklore and lots of other similar creatures. They were taken to America when Cornish and Welsh and everyone else, uh, miners, emigrated to America and took their folklore and their stories with them. And they became the American folklore of the Tommy Knocker. Now, let's actually explain. You might, I'm going off on one and you might not even know what these creatures are. So they are mining piskies. They live underground and they're actually, for the most part, very helpful and very benevolent and they don't mean miners any harm. So a common story is that um, you eat your pasty, holding the crust, of course, because your hands are dirty. But really, I like to think you're holding the crust because um, you're giving that away to the knocker at the end of your crib, at the end of your lunch. <laughs> so they really, really like pasties, of course, like proper Cornish men <laughs> and women. <laughs> so if you give them pasties at every crib time, crib's another a dialect word for lunch, um, or break, I suppose. But if you give your pasties to them at crib time, then they'll like you and they'll help you. So by help, I mean that they will knock on the side of the mine to let you know where the best ore is. Now that knock is quite slow and methodical. It's something that doesn't scream danger to you, but it's something that you hear and it's something that you follow and they lead you to the best ore veins uh, if they like you. OK, so definitely, you know, share your pasties with them. However, they also knock frantically when a mine is about to collapse in. So you definitely want them to like you because if a mine is about to collapse, it is the knockers that are helping the miners get to safety by alerting them as soon as possible. Um, so I really like the stories of knockers in the mines because there's that lovely element of mutual respect between human beings and um, the creatures of the other world. Um, and I think that's really nice. And, you know, even if you don't believe in these creatures, uh, a lot of folklore is uh, it holds up a mirror to society and it shows our moral and ethical beliefs it shows our desires it shows our fears it shows the way that we view the world so i definitely see folklore and storytelling as a mirror for people and i'm really interested in it for that reason so it shows that treating other people with kindness and mutual respect will be good for you in the long run better than being rude and um, greedy and keeping all your pasty to yourself um, and there's a particular story in fact of a young lad who like many young lads in Cornwall was very um, excited to become a miner because his father and his father in front of him and so on and so forth um, were miners. So it was a, a job that held a lot of significance and a lot of pride for Cornish people but of course uh, his first day down the mine and he realises it's actually really cold and a bit wet and uh, very dangerous and not very fun at all in fact. Um, so he's built up being a miner in his head uh, but it comes to it and he's hungry, he's cold and he's not having a very good time and uh, someone on shift uh, just has finished a pasty, he's going back on shift and he notices that he's popped a bit of the pasty in the wall and he thinks it's a bit 
bit silly, isn't it? You know, he's just put some of his food in the water. I'm going to nick it. I'm going to pinch the food because I'm hungry uh, and I don't want to wait till I get home. So I'm going to pinch that pasty. <gasps> oh, no, he should not have pinched the pasty because, of course, the fella was not leaving a pasty, half of a pasty in the wall for himself to munch on later. Can't say it would be that tasty after, you know, being stuck down a mine for a four hour shift. Um, I say four hours at the end of a lunch break. Um, I don't think they did four hours in total. <laughs> but no, it was in fact left for the knocker, who was very, very, very offended and upset to find that his pasty had been eaten and bonked the boy on the head. And, um, you know, depending on how gruesome you want to get, yeah, he could live or he, he could not. Um, I've heard the story told a few different ways. So don't ever get between a Cornishman and his pasty. It's just not going to end well for you. Um, so those are the Cornish knockers. Um, I love them to bits, but you might well have heard of them. So if you've heard of the Cornish Pisky that likes to sit on toadstools and you've heard of the Cornish Knocker, have you then heard of Spriggans? Now, Spriggans are a really interesting bit of Cornish folklore because they actually pop up a lot in um, fantasy and pop culture relating to fantasy and video games. So Spriggans um, are shown in the um, video game series Elder Scrolls and they pop up in all of those games or most of them. Um, but there, there's no indication that they're anything to do with Cornwall, Cornish folklore, because the Spriggans in these video games seem to be, in fact, based on the Marilyn Collins sculpture found in Crouch End, London, in um, the Parkland Walk. Now, this sculpture depicts a creature that seems to be um, of the earth completely, seems to have, like... Uh, woodland sprouting out of its body and that is the same for the creature found in a lot of uh, fantasy and a lot of video games this creature made of seemingly made of trees and flowers and plants but that is completely different to how the spriggan is described in a lot of cornish folklore and folk tales, you know, primarily collected by Robert Hunt, by William Bottrell and by um, other folklorists as well. But the Spriggan in those stories is depicted as um, quite a, a wizened, uh, twisted old man looking like, but with a big head and kind of bulging features, almost childlike features, big eyes, big ears, um, usually a bold head, usually kind of, you know, scrunched over like this, quite uh, full of warts and all sorts of lovely things. So quite um, uh, a, a pitiful and pathetic looking creature, to be honest, not um, a jolly rosy cheeked pisky that's often depicted in a lot of children's storybooks. No, the Spriggan is made of nastier stuff. So what the main attributes of the Spriggan are is that it usually haunts um, old ruins and old abandoned buildings. Now, I use the term haunt because the Spriggan, uh, maybe even more so than other types of Cornish pisky like creatures, um, is described as being a spirit. So a lot of folklorists have theorised that the Spriggan was in fact uh, a spirit of the giants of Cornwall who were driven out of Cornwall by Christianity. So giants of Cornwall is a whole other topic for another day. But in many um, myths and legends, Cornwall was first inhabited by a race of giants. And there are many famous giants in Cornish folklore. In fact, Jack the Giant Slayer is um, a Cornish a Cornish lad. He's a Cornish boy. And um, defeating Cormoran on St. Michael's Mount is where he begins his journey. But anyway, Spriggans are said to be 
the spirits of giants. So one of their powers, and they do have many powers, but one of them is that they can swell in size to become like giants. So they can go from these tiny, scrunched over, wizened creatures to um, giant-like and, you know, very horrifying and terrifying. Now, they also conjure up great storms. And all of this is in the pursuit of guarding their treasure that they have hidden in the ruins of an old abandoned building. Yeah, not very nice at all. I've also read stories of Spriggans with their little bows and arrows, shooting their bows and arrows at people, which seems to be quite similar to a lot of um, folklore and mythology found in other parts of the UK and also in Scandinavia with elves and elf shot, which is, you know, elves shooting a bow and arrow um, at their prey, victim. <laughs> I don't know if they eat them. Um, probably not. But Spriggans are not very nice, but completely different to what you might have encountered in other um, pop culture. And then last but not least, so we've covered um, moorland, we've covered, you know, woods and forest and that kind of thing. Um, and also old ruins and abandoned places in Cornwall. But we haven't talked about the sea and the coast. Now, of course, Cornwall is a sea peninsula. So we do have a little bit of that, a little bit of coast, a little bit of sea. And there is, in fact, a almost sea-like pisky, and that is the booker. Now, quite similar to the Welsh booker and the Irish pooker, which are both like fairy-like or pisky-like creatures found in Irish and Welsh mythology, um, the booker in Cornish folklore has two sort of roles. It's in some folk tales, the booker is a, a kind of sea god, is a merman um, with seaweed hair and all sorts of other lovely things. Looks like he's really just walked straight from the sea. And it was said that Newlyn fishermen left offerings on the beach for him as a kind of votive offering to this sea god. But however, there is also stories of booker as a separate type of pisky or fairy tribe. Now this seems um, definitely in the stories of William Bottrell, who was a very prominent um, 19th century uh, Cornish folklorist. But in those stories and in others as well, the booker are in fact another type of pisky. And again, they're very much um, capricious. They can be good, they can be bad, but they are tied to the coast and to areas near the sea. Bookers seem to be um, quite prominent in Newlyn and Penzance, so West Cornwall. And that's in fact something that should be brought up more is that Cornwall itself is not um, homogenous with these stories. There are some stories that relate to regions of Cornwall more than others. So hopefully you've enjoyed this quick little tour of Cornish Piskies. Um, there are lots of books that you can read. You can read um, William Bottrell, Robert Hunt, Catherine Briggs, lots of, um, all Brian Froud. There's lots of authors and folklorists who have talked about Cornish Piskies. Um, you can also find me on sh Twitter at Sean Esther or Celtic Myths Pod. So I run a podcast called Celtic Myths and Legends and I have also talked about lots of different Cornish folklore and mythology and tales on that podcast as well. Um, thank you very much for listening and happy St Perrin's Day. Gul Perrin Lowen.